Cowan from George Mason University, where he's the Holbert L. Harris Chair in Economics and also the Faculty Director of the Mercatus Center. Tyler is the author of numerous research papers, best-selling books, co-author of The Marginal Revolution, and he hosts the podcast Conversations with Tyler. Tyler joined us today to talk about the economic and ethical dilemmas of fighting COVID-19. Uh, I'll be monitoring the Q&A part of the, of, the, of the Zoom here. So if you have any questions, make sure to post the questions there. But also in the end, if you want to raise your hand and ask questions to Tyler, I'll call you on it uh, uh, at, once he's done, he's done talking. Tyler, welcome to UT. Thank you, Carlos and Megan. Uh, the talk I was going to give has been completely upended for the better by events of this morning. So I have an entirely uh, or mostly new set of points to make because there has been such good, fantastic news in the fight against the pandemic. And you probably have heard, uh, but the company Pfizer has announced that it has results back on its test of its vaccine. It's called an mRNA vaccine and the results are phenomenally good. So it is believed vaccine is efficacious over 90%, possibly quite a bit higher, 90%. Not long ago, we would have considered it a big success had they hit a threshold of say 60%. Public health experts also believe that if the Pfizer vaccine works, the Moderna vaccine is likely to work. The Novavax vaccine, Sankofi vaccine are also likely to work. So this is probably better news than it sounds about just one vaccine working. It's about a whole approach to vaccines working based on what is called the spike protein. And this is going to be uh, changing our lives very soon. So one set of tragic choices has been taken away from us and we now have another set of tragic choices, but they're much happier tragic choices than the old tragic choices. Pfizer claims that this calendar year, they will have 50 million doses ready and that next year, 2021, which is not that far away, they are likely to have over a billion doses ready. So again, obviously that's very good news. And if you think about the other vaccines that will be reporting uh, their results shortly, uh, we're going to be in much better shape to fight the pandemic. So you might wonder, well, what are the outstanding ethical issues at this point? And let me talk through a few of those because they still are uh, very, very important. So the first one just concerns your personal conduct. Uh, I believe this new news means that you should be much more careful over the next, say, three or four months than you otherwise might have planned to be. So let's think through why that is the case. And this is based on an economic concept called intertemporal substitution. The idea of longstanding in economics, but it was emphasized from University of Minnesota, most of all in the 1980s. Intertemporal substitution just says when you're deciding when to do something, you should take advantage of the incentive facing you. So let's say, for instance, a store runs a one-day sale. Oh, you know, half off on grapefruit juice, but it's only one day. Well, that one day you should run out and buy a lot. Let's say they announce a sale that will last for a year. Well, actually, in the short run, you don't need to respond very much at all because the sale will be on a year. Most of us behave that way intuitively. That's an example of intertemporal substitution. You ask, when do I want to do something? And then you think about incentives you're facing. So let's think about socializing, visiting your family for Thanksgiving, visiting your family for Christmas, getting on an airplane, uh, going to a crowded sporting event. With the new news on vaccines, uh, you now should plausibly believe that by, say, March or April, uh, you have a good chance of getting a vaccine. And if you're a high-risk individual, you have really quite a very good chance of getting a vaccine. Uh, that actually means you should wait. 
before consuming. So you should be more reluctant to visit your family. You should be more reluctant to go to the football game. You should be more reluctant to say, dine inside. And think about why that is. Let's say there were no vaccine at all on the way and that we would have to go another five years. And over the course of that five years, probably most people would get coronavirus. If you're going to get it anyway, and you have five years of a tough, ugly slog, it may well be rational to say, look, I'm going to get it anyway. I just have to get on and live my life. I can't hide in the closet forever. So based on that assumption, you should then be relatively what people might call reckless. Compared to your alternative, getting it now, getting it later, it's not actually that reckless in net terms. But let's say vaccine is coming, as indeed is the case. Now, all you have to do is wait until March or April. You can postpone your event, postpone visiting your friend, postpone going to the theater, whatever you might be thinking you want to do. So the moral thing to do now in terms of ethics is simply to do a lot more postponement. Because you don't have to wait five years, you just have to wait a few months. Let's say someone told you, well, a cure will be available in two days. Should you then tomorrow run out to the shopping mall or should you then spend two days staying at home? Obviously, you should then spend the two days staying at home. Now, three or four months is not as great news as two days, but still on the spectrum of news compared to what we used to expect, you should substitute intertemporally the next few months, spend a lot more time at home, even relative to what you had been doing. And then come March or April, you get the vaccine, your friends get the vaccine, or maybe you're still waiting in line. Your parents or grandparents get the vaccine before you do, and they're protected. Uh, then it's actually pretty remarkable that you can go crazy doing all the different things you've been waiting to do. And that is a case of intertemporal substitution, right? Based on the incentives. So the first ethical issue is just, what should I do now? And I believe the ethical and also the prudential answer, answer in your self-interest is right now you should wait. You may be frustrated having been at home for so long, having so restricted your activities, but actually now, if there was ever a time to restrict your activities more, it's over the next few months. And that I think is the first and most important uh, ethical implication. If we think about this from the point of view of policy as a whole, I think we should be a little more reluctant to just reopen everything. So again, if you thought the status quo was going to persist for five years, you might well say, well, we can't keep all these things closed for five years, they'll just disappear. If you think it's more like three or four months, again, that sounds more feasible. And that's again, getting back to this key idea of intertemporal substitution. Uh, some number of countries or even some of the people in this country have pursued a deliberate strategy of what is sometimes called herd immunity. The herd immunity strat strategy is basically to say, well, this pandemic, it's very painful. Not only does it kill people, it ruins economies, it harms our mental health. It actually could be better if we got it over with by everyone getting infected relatively quickly rather than slowly and having the young people who are safest get infected first because they're the most protected keep the old people somewhat removed from the others, have a lot of people get it quickly, there will be some casualties, but just get it over with, and then we have some degree of built-in immunity, and then we can get on with our lives. A herd immunity in March and April may well have been a plausible strategy. It was the strategy pursued uh, by Sweden. It was the strategy advocated by many people in the Trump administration. To some partial extent, still the current strategy in the US. I say partial extent 
because we have a national government, state governments, county, city, and the total strategy is very complicated. At least at the national level for the Trump administration, herd immunity was the professed view that we're not really gonna do much to try to stop this. We need to live through it. We may even wish to accelerate it. It seems to me uh, that is now much less desirable than it might have seemed even a week or two ago or even yesterday, uh, precisely because the vaccine is on its way and the vaccine is likely to be much more effective than we had been expecting. So I think it's changing our notion of uh, what is optimal policy. There's another issue about these vaccines. It's quite subtle and I haven't seen this discussed much one interesting feature of the current crop of vaccines is even the ones that protect you don't necessarily stop you from transmitting it to other people. So let me give you just a simple illustration of how this could work. And again, the details depend on the vaccine. There's your upper respiratory tract and there's your lower respiratory tract. Your upper respiratory tract if it has the virus, when you talk, when you sing, whatever, when you hug and kiss people, you can spread the virus to them. But if you keep the virus out of your lower respiratory tract, well, you're probably still fairly protected. But one thing we don't quite yet know about these vaccines is do they protect only the person being vaccinated or do they also stop you from transmitting? It could be that it protects the lower respiratory tract, not the upper. So therefore you're safe getting the vaccine, it will be stopped. You could still be walking around transmitting to other people. So this raises the ethical dilemma of there being a short run issue, of great danger. If you know that you are safe, you might be a carrier, you're actually a lot more likely to be reckless. So there's the possibility, I stress the word possibility, we do not know, the possibility we will have a short period of a few months where some people are vaccinated and they feel invulnerable and they go around and they actually spread it a lot more than they would have otherwise. And this is a problem because not everyone is vaccinated yet. So the intermediate period, even past March and April, there's a possibility that for some people it will be more dangerous. So many of us will feel invulnerable, but we will still have this capability of carrying it. So watch very closely the new news coming out about these vaccines. Not just do they protect you, but do they mean you cannot be a carrier? And the current data we have don't show you that yet. If it's the case that you're protected and you can still be a carrier, then we actually need to be careful for a longer period of time. And we might need an especially strict norm because now, like if you ask me, oh, Tyler, let's go to the bowling alley. I'm like, whoa, I'm not gonna go to the bowling alley. I don't wanna get COVID. My chance of dying would be like half of 1% if I got COVID. And that keeps me safe because I don't wanna die. But if I'm pretty selfish and I'm like, yeah, let's go bowling. You know, I'll get COVID, I'll be fine. I'll just carry it around, give it to all the people I work with. There's a possibility that is what our future looks like. And that will be an ethical issue and we'll need some kind of social norm to deal with that. Now, what else are the ethical and economic problems we are faced with, with these new vaccines? And the first one uh, will really be quite striking and that is who gets the vaccines first. Now there's some amount of agreement that people in the military might get it early because we, we, we need them to do their job. I think there's a fair amount of agreement that people who work in hospitals, people who treat COVID patients, people who work in nursing homes, they will get it very early because they're vulnerable. I don't think those are such controversial decisions. Uh, President-elect Biden, once he's president, is going to get it very early. He may get it really very, very soon. Past that point, 
it's not so easy to answer the question, who should get it first? And here's the basic dilemma. If you ask who is most vulnerable to COVID risk, we now know quite clearly, it is people who are older in age, right? So you might think, well, we need to vaccinate them first. Well, that's a possible answer. But other people say, the real problem is transmission. If the vaccine is able to protect the recipients and stop their transmission, arguably, we should vaccinate the young people first. Because say, if grandpa gets COVID, odds are grandpa got it from his grandson. And it might be safer from, for grandpa to vaccinate the grandson rather than vaccinating grandpa. So the second view says, well, you need to protect the spreaders. But here's a way to think about the moral issue. The people who are the spreaders, almost by definition, they're the least responsible people. They're the people who don't take good care, they'll go to the big indoor rally, go to the indoor rodeo or whatever it is, you, the bowling alley, whatever it is you think might be dangerous. They're the spreaders. So you are rewarding people who have done the worst job protecting others. And that's the ethical dilemma. Do you wish to vaccinate for maximum effectiveness? Then you would say, target the super spreaders. Or do you wish to vaccinate the people who are obviously the most vulnerable? I'm not sure there's an objectively correct answer to that question. I can tell you under my personal point of view, subjective point of view, I would rather protect super spreaders first and save more lives. But you are giving it to the people who are least deserving by the standards of common sense morality. Uh, should we do that? Again, I, I'm not sure that's an issue we can resolve by rational argumentation, but it is an issue that will be before us very, very quickly. If you're asking for a prediction, I've been proxy to a number of these discussions. I will strongly predict we will vaccinate the vulnerable first to feel better about ourselves. But in essence, we will be sacrificing some number of human lives by vaccinating, say, much older people first. One reason we will do that, of course, is because if you ask in this country, who votes the most, the older people or the younger people? I don't even have to ask you, you know, on average, the older people vote more. So if they're the voters and politicians want to appeal to voters, voters are somewhat short-sighted. Most voters don't understand, well, it'll be safer, Grandpa, if we vaccinate all the younger people first. It's a hard sell. It's sort of an abstract theory. It's hard to prove to Grandpa. Grandpa's like, why can't you vaccinate me? And that's what I think we're going to do. It's highly likely we vaccinate the older people first. And I would just say it's not obvious that is the correct decision. Another decision we will face, I'm pretty sure what we'll do, but again, the, the ethics of this, in my view, are unclear. So COVID has proven more dangerous in some countries rather than others. So for instance, the nation of Mexico the data are very sketchy, but it is commonly believed that the death rate in Mexico is considerably higher than the death rate in the United States. It's not a surprise. Mexico has a high rate of diabetes. There are many more comorbidities, as they are called. Mexicans, on average, don't have access to the same quality of health care that Americans do. So the, the claim that the fatality rate is higher in Mexico, it's, it's very likely to be true, even though the numbers in Mexico, they're, they're pretty hard to make sense of. So now we're going to have all these doses of vaccine in the United States, and we need to ask the question, are we going to spend all of those doses on ourselves first, or are we going to give some of them to Mexico? Uh, 
It's a good question. Again, I'm not sure there's an objectively correct answer, but it is pretty likely that we would save more human lives by giving some of the doses to Mexico first, to El Salvador, to Brazil, uh, whichever the countries are at that moment that have the biggest problem, we could save more lives in total by sacrificing some American lives to send some doses of the vaccine overseas to poorer countries. Uh, so how much of this should we do? Uh, again, I don't have a simple answer for you. My personal tendency is to be at the margin more cosmopolitan than what we are likely to do. It is simply one of the ethical dilemmas that will be facing us soon. And when I used to give this talk before today, I didn't really bring this up much because we were not so readily on the verge of having this usable, highly effective uh, vaccine. So it's interesting to compare the United States in this regard to China. So China has its own vaccines. They're actually, some of them, ready for use right now. And China is going around the world, in essence, trading these vaccines to other nations, such as Pakistan would be one example, but much of the world, United Arab Emirates would be another example, Caribbean. And China is saying to these countries, we'll let you cut in line. You can have some of our vaccine doses, but only if you support China on foreign policy, typically against the United States. So China is trading its vaccines for favors. And you could ask the additional ethical question, is this an appropriate thing to do? Well, it will probably save more lives. But if you're extracting favors from countries to do things that in the broader scheme of things may well be the wrong thing to do, such as recognizing various Chinese territorial claims, uh, you're, you're back at this issue. What is the ethical way to deploy your vaccine? Should you just trade it away for foreign policy favors? The United States had an opportunity to join an international consortium where uh, it basically was a vaccine sharing agreement. And we decided we weren't going to do this. That in essence was the Trump administration signaling, we're probably gonna keep most of the vaccine for ourselves. Since then, there's been an election, of course, uh, very likely the next president will be Joseph Biden, and we will face this decision once again. Another ethical question you might consider, I mean, let's say you're Pakistan and China has given you some vaccine, and you agreed that you would recognize Chinese territorial claims in the South China Sea, you get your vaccine, some of your people are saved. Are you now, in fact, morally obliged to follow through on that contract? and do something that for the world as a whole may actually be the wrong thing. Uh, many countries will be faced with that dilemma. Probably what the United States will do is in fact, in some critical situations, use some doses of our vaccine to achieve foreign policy goals. Uh, we're not saying we're gonna do this. China is being very open and blatant, but at the end of the day, there'll be some crises, some emergencies, and our leaders will want some kind of quick fix and there'll be whatever kind of agreement at the moment. And do I think that some American vaccine doses, if only implicitly will be part of that deal, I do. Again, it gets back to the question, who should get those doses and in what order? The reality you're gonna see will be very much real politic, but the ethics of how to do it right, that's just something we're gonna to need to discuss uh, much more than what we've been doing. Now, let me give what is right now really one of the biggest ethical questions. And this is a little complex. This we really need to get right very soon. And the stakes are very, very high. It's such a complex issue that I think in a democracy, very few people are aware of it. And here's the thing. It's, as you probably know, and as I've been mentioning, there are multiple vaccines in the works. And of course, that's very, very good news. That's like typically not the case. Usually there's one vaccine and we're hoping it will work. And in the past, usually it worked, but it's just one vaccine. 
now under Operation Warp Speed, there's, there's seven, there's other vaccines from overseas, yet other vaccines on the way, like a menagerie of vaccines. So once one of these vaccines is approved, let's say it's the Pfizer vaccine, probably the leading candidate for an emergency use authorization first, you then have to ask, what do you do with the other clinical trials? So we are running trials to test all the other vaccines. And how do we run those trials? We run those trials by, for instance, giving half the people the real vaccine from Novavax, and then you give half the people a placebo. You jab them in the arm, ouch, it hurts. But maybe they didn't get the vaccine. Maybe you just jabbed them in the arm. And over time, you compare the progress of those who got the real thing from Novavax versus those who got the placebo. And if there's a big difference, then you know that's a good vaccine and you learn a large amount about safety, about efficacy. So these other trials, many of them are underway. Some others will be starting over time. But here's what biomedical ethics typically has said. You may or may not agree. This has been the previous norm. Now, once we have one good vaccine, as we will pretty soon, everyone in those trials, you have to give them all that one good vaccine. You can't run the trial where half of them get some other vaccine and half get the placebo because the ones getting the placebo, some number of them, maybe a small number, but some number of them, they're gonna get COVID and they're gonna die. And under many approaches to biomedical ethics, that's wrong, that you're gonna let some of these people die. But what happens if you went around and gave everyone this new Pfizer vaccine, which is over 90% effective? All your other trials, they're not giving you good information anymore because the people who were getting the Novavax vaccine, people who are getting the placebo, or maybe just the people who are getting the placebo, they're now getting this other vaccine. So let's say the Novavax vaccine is four percentage points more effective and a Pfizer, that's going to be much harder to see in the data. In essence, having one good working vaccine interferes with your ability to keep these other trials going. And we're really not sure what to do about that. Now, I'm one of these economist types, as you know. So my proposed solution, which I've written about a bit, I'm, I'm working with some people who favor the same, is to keep the other trials going and in essence pay people if need be a lot of money to stay in them and keep some of those people on the placebo. And if you need to give them thousands of dollars to not take the new vaccine and do it, because those trials will generate a lot of information. And over time, the vaccines will improve. We need that information it's not just one vaccine. We want better vaccines over time that last longer, protect more, protect the elderly better, maybe limit transmissibility better. The first vaccine could be great. But I tell you, the fourth, fifth vaccines, they're going to be a lot better. You don't just want to stop those trials. So as an economist and just as an individual, I disagree with those strictures of biomedical ethics that say you can't keep on going with the placebo You've got to give everyone the first approved vaccine. You see what I'm saying? So I don't know what we're going to do about this. I know what I think we should do, which is keep on with the placebos and compensate people for risk. Just like we compensate people for taking on dangerous jobs like policemen. Or do you know what's the most dangerous job in the United States, I read? Most people don't guess this. The most dangerous job in the United States is to work on a fishing boat that's out on the water. Much more dangerous than being a cop, even in a high crime city. How is it we get people to work on fishing boats? Well, we pay them a lot. The wage is really pretty high to work on a fishing boat and you don't need a college degree. People take more risk, we pay them. They're informed about the risk. It's not a perfect solution. You wish everyone were rich and didn't have to work on a fishing boat but we tolerate that. So I wanna treat these other clinical trials the way right now we treat people working on fishing boats, pay people to take the risk of only being on the placebo. 
and I'm genuinely unsure what we should do, but it's a case where economics and ethics come together and clash. And we're going to have to, to, to make a decision on that one. And uh, that won't really be a public debate. That will be a debate amongst the elites. I think the public is really not very well aware of what's going on. And it's hard to sum up in a simple slogan. So that's a big deal, that one. Uh, keep your eyes on it. You might also wonder the Pfizer vaccine, uh, what's it going to be placed at? Indications I saw today will be it will be priced at $20, which I think is a reasonable price. It actually will scare some people off. Economists will insist to you demand curves slope downwards. More people will get it at zero price than at 20. But of course, the company, Pfizer, needs revenue. That revenue will encourage successor companies to make better and better vaccines. So we don't want to tell Pfizer you can't charge people for the vaccine. I think there's a genuine case you can make for subsidizing people to take the vaccine. So they do it more quickly, especially super spreaders. So let's say the government would go around and hand out subsidy certificates, uh, not money, but kind of like a Nordstrom gift certificate, right? Anyone give you a Nordstrom gift certificate? You take it, you go buy something at Nordstrom. How about a vaccine gift certificate, $20? I tend to think the government should do that to encourage those people who are really at the margin. Of course, those are mostly going to be poorer individuals. Uh, and they're the ones at high, highest risk of dying from COVID on average. So uh, let's do more to protect them. There's also an external benefit for others as more and more people get the vaccine. The general issue is just how to communicate to the American public about the benefits of the vaccine. It seems highly likely it will be, if not totally safe, certainly much safer than running the risk of getting COVID. But when you poll people, well, how many of you want to get the vaccine? I've seen different polls. Uh, I'm not sure any of them are that fully reliable. And none of these polls are, are based on the current understanding of just how good this vaccine will be. But still, some of the polls I see, like only 40% of the people want to get the vaccine at all. And that's very bad for the nation. So you want to think about what is the best way of inducing more people to get the vaccine? A gift certificate is fine, but at a price of $20, like for most people, money is probably not the main thing. The main thing is they don't trust their authorities. They don't trust science. They don't trust at least one political party. Many people don't trust either one, believe it or not. Who, who could imagine that in our fine nation of America? So, the issue of risk communication. If you have something very important to tell a person, what is actually the most effective way to get that message across? This will be a major, major challenge. I'm not sure how good of a job we will do at it, but it will be a, one of the major issues moving forward. How will we get people actually to take the vaccine? I have just a few minutes left. Let me just close by talking a little bit about the role of economists in vaccine discovery. So we have had something that you've almost certainly heard of called Operation Warp Speed run by the Trump administration. And the idea for Operation Warp Speed came from an economist or a group of economists, but the leader of the group, most prominent member of the group, his name is Michael Kramer. And the year before, what's it now, uh, 13 and a half months ago, Michael Kramer won a Nobel Prize in economics. And Michael Kramer's idea was, well, these vaccines, there are very high upfront costs. At the end of it all, you're not sure the vaccine is going to work. But the way to get an effective vaccine is to have the government commit upfront to buy a large number of vaccine doses whether or not the vaccine works. So government spends a lot of money with this commitment. Not all the vaccines are gonna work. So the government at some point will be sending billions of dollars 
to companies that don't have good vaccines. But some of the companies will, and indeed already do, have vaccines, and those are pre-purchased. That's why this calendar year, we're already going to have about 50 million doses from Pfizer. That's remarkable. We have that because of what is called an economics advanced market commitment to purchase. And that was when the government, the Trump administration, said to seven different vaccine projects, up front now, we're going to buy a very large number of doses from you, working on making them, building them right now. This money is guaranteed. And the companies did that. They did it remarkably quickly. So you can even read, say, New York Times interviewing experts as late as April. And they ask those experts, how long will a vaccine take? And the experts say, oh, you know, it could take, if we're lucky, we'll have one in four years. Some of the experts said, I'm not sure we'll ever have one. Now, basically, we have one in, in nine or 10 months. And a lot of the credit for that, it goes to economics. It goes to this idea of advanced market commitment. It goes to Michael Kramer and all the people who worked with him. And just that we as a nation went ahead and actually did this and had the foresight to allocate the money because those vaccines, once they are operative, will more than pay for themselves by a factor of many, many times over. So if you're looking for instances in history, in the history of our nation, where economics has been really effective, I mean, I would say Operation Warp Speed is actually one of the biggest and best examples of all time. And I would send my kudos uh, to Michael Kramer. I have a podcast with him I did last month. You can Google my name and his. He and I talk about all these issues uh, that's online. Anyway, those are just some of the economic and ethical dilemmas we're facing. They're not all of them. This is a very different talk from what I thought I would have to give. Way cheerier. I don't think it's easy. You still need to be extra safe, extra careful. Uh, there is a ray of sunshine around the corner. No, it's not next week, but it's within a few months' time. And with that, I will stop my formal remarks and leave it open to all of you to ask me questions and et cetera. Sorry, I cannot be there, but a pleasure to speak to you all. And most of all, thank you to my hosts. Thank you. Thanks, Tyler. Um, I have a lot of questions here. Let me start with the first one is, as an economist, you talked a lot about, about um, ethical issues associated with the decision of who to allocate, how to allocate the vaccine. And but you didn't mention prices as a what roles you think prices should be should play in the allocation process of a vaccine. That's a very good question. So there's one view in economics that says you should just charge market clearing prices and let bites or other companies charge whatever they want to. Uh, my view is that is not politically sustainable. I do think there's a, a good chance that would be a pretty efficient solution. It would encourage more production, uh, but the company would be accused of profiteering, price controls would be put on, you would end up with a shortage. So I think you need a system where the price is fairly low, perceived as fair by the public, that you get a high quantity of the vaccine up front by this advanced market commitment. That is going to mean you're going to have to allocate by principles like age, vulnerability, uh, you know, gender. You know, men are more vulnerable to COVID. Does that mean all the men should get the vaccine first? I'm not sure everyone in this audience would consider that fair, but it is an argument you can make. It seems men are like 13 to 15% more vulnerable than women are. Did all the men get it first? Again, I don't think there's an objectively correct answer, but you will be faced with that issue because I think just normal market pricing, say the way we sell diamonds, oh, we just don't have a politics that can handle that. You know, there'll be these secondary sectors, you know, say you're very wealthy, you're not first in line in the queue. I mean, you're not actually going to have to wait two months, fly to the Cayman Islands or something. You know, you'll pay someone $20,000 and you'll jump the queue and you'll get your vaccine. Like that's going to be there. The so people who need to jump the queue or just subjectively perceive a great urgency or have a lot of money they want to spend the fringes, there'll be these gray or maybe even black markets where we will just use normal market prices 
And that will, to some extent, alleviate what we economists would call the deadweight loss from this artificially low price of $20. So I just don't think we can do regular full flat out market clearing prices, uh, whether or not we should. I don't really think that's sustainable politically. All right, I'm gonna call here, uh, there has a hand up, uh, Dirakesh Patel, you should be allowed to speak, go ahead. Oh, hi Dirakesh, oh, you're hey, awesome, uh, how are you? I'm good, how are you, Professor? I think I'm fine, <laughs> better today uh -oh. than yesterday. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you, uh, given the new vaccine timeline, should my university be gearing up to have in-person classes next semester? Depends on many other things you're doing. So my university has some in-person classes now, partly because we don't have that much campus life and our students don't drink that much and some of them are older in age. If you have a school with a lot of very good rapid testing, think you could have a lot of in-person classes with or without this vaccine. I don't know how things are at UT Austin, but I would say if you're only a middling performer, the vaccine will not be here quickly enough to make a difference. And your young, you know, your students are young, I assume, they're not going to get it first. So no, it's not going to change the basic calculus. So whatever you think the correct answer is, this next semester, this vaccine won't change it. Maybe after spring break, even then, probably not. But January, February, it's going to be the same. All right, let me move on here to Gregory Salmieri. You should be allowed to talk. Go ahead. Hi, really interesting presentation. Um, I'm not hearing you. All right, sorry, Greg. You, you got I mean, Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, now I hear you. Okay, thanks. Uh, I said... Um, really enjoyed the presentation. Uh, I noticed that you posed the question of who should get the vaccine first, separately from the question of whether we should continue uh, the trials on the other vaccines. Um, but it seems to me there's a lot of interaction between those issues, given that um, not everyone will get it right away. There's a lot of people who won't have it and presumably they could be among the um, people on trials for other vaccines. But of course, since that differential won't be random between the two groups. It would affect what kind of information we'll get out of the trials. Do you have any uh, thoughts on the interplay between those two issues? Well, they are closely related, as you suggest. Uh, I have not personally had a peek at the data from those other trials. I hear secondhand from a number of people who have. To me, it sounds very positive. So one option, which I'm not quite ready to recommend, but at some point we should consider it to just say, well, we have enough data, we can end those other trials and just approve some of those other vaccines. Again, I'm not saying we should do that now, but we could reach a point where that's the correct thing to do. Typically, the FDA in the past just does not make that kind of exception. Uh, in the future, I would encourage them to at least consider it. And again, I'm not saying we should do it right now. But that's a way in which you could have the big flood of supply. Uh, it might be somewhat more risky but uh, it's also a risk in letting COVID infect so many people. So there's the possibility that even if we cannot pay people to keep on taking the placebo in these human challenge trials, we could just say enough is enough. You know, we're ready to go ahead with these other vaccines. So that will be a choice pretty soon. I'd want to see the data before making my own recommendation, however. All right, Ehud, go ahead. Tyler, this is going to sound harsh, but I'm going to ask a question. Um, do we have a right to say to our leadership that they have no right to be cosmopolitan in their decisions? We do. I mean, that's a defensible point of view that the U.S. government should put U.S. citizens first. Uh, I'm not sure it's correct, but I don't think you should call it harsh probably what most people in this country believe, or what most people around the world believe. Now, should there be some foreign aid? You can debate how much, but I, it's definitely a contender view. And again, it has more closer to majority support than any other view. So I don't mean to cast dispersion on it. I would just say at the margin, I do see the value to saving additional human lives. And it may rebound to the greater benefit of the United States as well. 
in the long term. So I have another question here in the chat. Um, what do you think of the idea of rewarding people who are frontline workers this whole time or who volunteer to sign up to be a frontline worker for the first dose of the vaccine after, let's say, healthcare workers and so on? Would that create sufficient incentive for those people to volunteer uh, for, to stay as frontline workers for future pandemics? Or it's highly likely we do that. I think it's an excellent idea. I don't think it will be controversial. But of course, it is hard to define who exactly is a frontline worker. Say you're a cashier at the local Whole Foods. Well, you're selling people food. Food is important. You're on the front line. Your risk of infection is somewhat higher than average. Are you a frontline worker? Again, I don't know where to draw that line. But as a general principle, it is both highly likely and I think it will be highly popular. But people are going to use that to like lead benefits to groups that are maybe at slightly higher risk. They don't, like me, necessarily sound like frontline workers. What about the UPS people who deliver packages? I mean, I love them. They, they fed me for months. But I mean, frankly, they just leave the package at my doorstep and they drive around all day. They're not really high risk workers that I can see. They'd be back in the warehouse somehow, but I think you're gonna see that being very politically contentious, accepting the principle where to draw the line. Dorakesh Patel, again, you have another question. You have your hand up, go ahead. Uh, hello, Professor. Uh, another question I had was, how do we determine who the super spreaders are if we're going to give them the vaccine first? Do we just set up dispensation at frat parties or something? Uh, I would be fine with, with setting up a dispensation at frat parties, large uh, indoor sporting events. There was a pretty careful study from Sweden. I know Sweden and U.S. don't work exactly the same. It determined that bus drivers and taxi drivers were really big super spreaders. So I think that's plausibly true in this nation. So they would also be on the list. You could imagine further studies being done, just tracing the course of cases. So I think we have a reasonable but not perfect idea. Like hermits are not super spreaders, right? It's people who come into contact with a lot of others. Uh, maybe people like you dance in strip clubs are super spreaders. Should they get it first? That's not a political winner. But there's a, a utilitarian Benthamite case be made for doing that. Let's see here. Um, anybody else, please raise your hand. I can call you here if you have a question. Um, there is a question on what's the estimated time between, say, the first 10% of people being vaccinated all the way to, let's say, get to 90%. Uh, and if this time frame is short, that might be unnecessary for us to ponder so much the implications of who gets it first. What's your take uh, on that? No one knows that time horizon are a group of people called super forecasters. They work with Philip Tetlock and they have an online site which will give you a very precise answer to their best estimate of when 50% of the public will get the vaccine. My prediction will be 90% will never get it. Once you hit some percentage number and we're not sure what it is, but say it's 70, the virus becomes so scarce, you know, the remaining people just won't see the need to get it. So I don't think we'll ever hit 90 how quickly it goes. There's a lot of obstacles. One is public perception, but another is what's called cold storage. The first vaccine, the Pfizer one, but not all of the others. You have to store it at very cold temperatures. When I say cold, I don't mean put it in your refrigerator. I think that the estimate I saw was like minus 70. It's not easy to store and transport things at minus 70 degrees. That will limit the speed at which we get it to everyone. Uh, so I don't think anyone knows how quick we'll be. Trump's plan was to have the military do this. Whether you think the military is better or worse than local public health authorities, this will be debated. This is just unprecedented. I, I genuinely think no one knows and it's really gonna take a while. So I have a question on the, on the um, if kids and young adults in particular are seem to be very, very, very um, safe against COVID in the sense that there's, a, there's very little evidence of long-term consequences associated with, with, with the effects of COVID and they don't seem to die. Then there's a very steep change in the curve as you get older, right? So that's a very different in, in terms of the risks associated with young and old. That said, um, 
like, is it, does it make, how do you think about like folks not wanting their kids or, or young adults being like, I don't want to take this vaccine. I don't want to take it because the, the risk associated with the potential side effects that we don't quite know yet might be actually higher than the risk of me having it. What are the mechanisms that we have to try to encourage and potentially, you know, cajole them into actually doing it? We're going to see a great deal of that. I would point out that for young adults, even though your chance of dying is quite small, uh, your chance of long-term damage or just feeling really, really bad for six months is not that small. We're not sure what it is. So there is some private reason to want to take the vaccine. But that's partly why we have such stringent testing on the safety for these vaccines. Citizens may or may not be convinced. But if the world proceeds by having older, more at risk, people take it first, not because of our decision, but simply because those are the only ones who will do it. I think that's okay. It's not optimal, but it may in any case outrace our ability to deliver it. In that sense, it may not be the binding constraint. I can just say as someone who is 58 years old, I'm not at zero risk, but I'm not in those really high risk categories. I have no known comorbidities. I've been studying this and related matters actually all year. Uh, I will not hesitate to get the vaccine once it is available. I will be in line as quickly as possible. And I think for a large number of Americans, that is the privately rational, selfish thing to do. Tom Sager. Tom, you should be able to talk. I don't hear you. Yes. You're muted still. How's that? Can you hear me now? Yes, good. Yes. Okay, this is more a comment than a question. Seems to me that there's a parallel between the issue of who gets the vaccine first and the use of limited mosquito netting in the tropics to protect against malaria. Those who are healthy want to have uh, anti-mosquito netting in order to stay healthy, but, but a, a, the point could be made that if you put the netting around those who are already sick and in the hospital, you cut off the supply for the mosquito vector to replenish itself. And you also, from an evolutionary point of view, keep the most virulent strains in the hospital where they don't get spread around. Yes, absolutely parallel issues. Uh, and again, we'll be faced with a version of this pretty quickly. Amazon. Andres? Can, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Th thank you. Thank you, Tyler, for being with us. It's very interesting. Very, you know, make make, make us think a lot about these issues. I, I have I have just a simple confirmation of, of of ask ask you something to confirm something that you said to be sure I understood correctly. Should we simply tell the presidents of the universities that we shouldn't have class in, 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 in presence next semester, given that the incentives, the temporal incentives, now have changed? And it makes a lot of sense to wait until the new, until the new uh, calendar year. But the uh, for new many year... schools, that is true. But I am aware of a number of schools that have such good testing programs, things already have gone fine. But for most schools, uh, we should be more reluctant to start in person in January. I agree. Thank All you. Right. Anybody else with their hands? Let's see here. Okay, Tyler, pleasure to have you with us. And uh, I hope we can do this again at some point after this vaccine is around and you can fly to Texas to, to see us. <laughs> I love Texas. I'm sorry to miss it. I love Austin. And uh, 